Pennsylvania governor lineup here. Tom Ridge, first United States Secretary of Homeland Security under George Bush, uh, 43rd governor of Pennsylvania from 1995 to 2001, and prior to that served as a member of the United States House of Representatives 1983 to 95. Currently, Mr. Ridge is the founder and CEO of Ridge Global LLC, a Washington, D.C.-based security consulting firm, author of The Test of Our Times, America Under Siege, and How We Can Best and how we can be safe again, Tom Ridge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the gracious introduction and thank you for your very warm reception. It's good to be with so many, so many of my, my colleagues and individuals with whom I've worked uh, off and on, both politically and in terms of policy. I'm great to be part of this distinguished group of panelists, and I want to thank you for your invitation to join you today. Oh, there has been so much said, so much to be done, and our collective efforts are to be recognized, applauded, but we still have a long way to go. And my first thoughts are of deep appreciation and gratitude to all of you and your colleagues, not only in this country, but around the world. But frankly, uh, you are the strongest, most resilient advocates that any group seeking humanitarian relief has ever had my judgment in the history of the world, and you are to be applauded as well. You're really right in that. <laughs> this has become very, very personal to, uh, well, I'll speak for myself, but I dare say to all of us. Uh, I take a look at uh, my friend Wes Martin and you know how personal it is to him because he lived and worked with the people of Ashraf and some of the other military leaders who lived and worked and got to know and got to respect and got to understand their desire for, uh, for democracy, for regime change, for living in peace with their neighbors, living in a community and a society that accepted diversity of thought, diversity of religion, a society that was non-nuclear, a society that wanted good relations with the West instead of antagonizing the West. So, and all of us, I think, have seen from one time or another and spent some time with family members. I mean, I've got to tell you, every time uh, I've been privileged to uh, interact with uh, family members, it's painful when, for them when they show me the pictures of people who have been murdered and assassinated by the mullahs. And we know that story. Since 1979, over 120,000. And the estimates are 80 or 90 percent were members of the MEK. It's been a continuous, sustained effort to deny the voices of democracy on well over almost 30, over 30 years. Uh, it's not that far back, 79, but then we remember what happened in Beirut a couple of years later. You can trace that to the, to the mullahs coming in. And then the embassies in Africa and the coal bombings. And I remember President Bush's speech when he talked about the axis of evil. Clearly, Iran was one of the countries, and why? Well, not only are they, well, they are the number one terrorist state in the world. We all know they support Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They're joined at the hip with Syria. And for those who think that the United Nations resolutions and condemnation has any impact on Iran, they just need to look in the region and see what has happened in Syria. UN sanctions and UN condemnation statements are normally ignored and regrettably, tragically, at a loss of 12,000 Syrians, men, women, and children, There'll continue to be condemnation, but little action. Talks, but little progress. 
So we get to the point now where we're doing all this time. The United States has been involved uh, in both bilateral actions with Iran, but let's take a look at the record of the United Nations itself. 2006 resolution, I think it's 1696. The UN strongly condemned an appeal to Iran to, to terminate its enrichment activities. Strongly condemned in 2006, and there have been six resolutions since 2006. Six resolutions. And while we continue to go to the UN, and frankly, there have been a lot of bipartisan, bi bilateral efforts to bring additional pressure on the Iranian regime, and many, many series of talks, more sanctions, more talks, and more centrifuges. But the more we talk, the closer they get to the kind of enrichment they need for nuclear weapons. I'm reminded, if you don't mind, a little levity of my daughter now is a wonderful woman, but as a child, when I was a young congressman, I brought her to town for a week and she stayed with dad. And I took her to my congressional office and she did some work. And I remember one time we were getting ready to leave and I turned on C-SPAN and they were debating something that I thought was frivolous. And I said, you know, we're going to go get dinner and go buy some clothes or go get a table. We're going to get out of here. You know, so we're going. And she had occasion to be talking to my wife at the time and she turned on the speaker of C-SPAN and she put the telephone receiver up to the television and said, did you hear that? My little girl's five at the time. She said, Mommy, talk, talk, talk. That's all they do is talk. <laughs> I think uh, this very young, prescient lady, now a fine young woman, would say the same thing with regard to our talks with Iran our discussions. We agree to meet. And everybody looks at it as a success. Well, we had a conversation, you know what we did? We agreed to meet again. Well, during these, like some people may look at it as progress. I think all of us look at it as a, as a delay, an obfuscation. The more we talk, the more they dig, the faster the centrifuges spin. So what's the answer? Regime change. There's certainly not going to be... <laughs> Looking at some reading, I noted uh, President Obama once said, quote, let there be no doubt America is determined to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons, close quote. Well, the conversations don't appear to be taking us to that resolve or to that resolution. And at one point in time, I think we said, we don't even want you to have nuclear power. Well, they got nuclear power now, that's for sure. And no heavy water reactors, and they got those, and the next step, I guess, will be nuclear weapons. So the only answer is regime change. And at the heart of this effort, and we all believe that, is to recognize the democratic opposition. We know what we're talking about. It's the MEK. I'm not, I mean, this is an extent, I'm, if I were a, a uh, I'm, I'm preaching to men and women and, and sharing a vision and a hope and an aspiration that you have in your hearts and your heads for the longest time, and we're just here to reinforce it. But the fact of the matter is, we know that that, in order to move the men and women from Ashraf to Liberty and to resettlement with loved ones, there's going to have to be a delisting. We also know that as much as we would like that to happen, that fate, that decision is in the hands of the Secretary of State. And we know there have been judicial hearings, and who knows what that outcome will be. But there are a couple of things that need to be done even before that, hopefully, that outcome when they're finally delisted. And one is, is that we certainly need to have a habitable, humane environment as they move from Ashraf to Liberty. And we call on the administration. <laughs> and again, many of us have been involved in 
correspondence, phone calls, but, but, but the plea is simple. Understanding that the listening is a decision for which we will continue to advocate, but there's still the need to provide decent, living, habitable conditions so that while the UN, moving rather slowly at this point, moves hopefully more aggressively in the future in the resettlement process, that people can live in decent surroundings. So what do we beg for? Before that sixth convoy moves, what do we want? Well, it would certainly be nice if in the UN, and here's where the UN has a role to play, in addition to the US, would not categorize them as asylum seekers, but call Camp for Liberty a refugee camp. They need to be given that protection. And while you're at it, how about electricity? How about water on a regular basis? How about simple provisions for the disabled and the elderly? There's a long, long list. And I think the United States has some leverage. I believe the UN has some leverage. And it's my sincere hope, before that sixth convoy moves, remember, there have been many assurances given and very few delivered during the past five convoys. There are memorandums of understanding, as I understand it, been negotiated, I think, prior to the movement of every convoy. And if you did a checklist with regard to all the memos, you'd find that very few of the promises made were kept. And it's about time the Maliki government kept its word, and it's about time the United Nations and the United States exerted far more pressure, far more leverage on the decision makers in Iraq to deliver on the promises they made to the United States with the change of status of forces agreement was concluded several years ago. When the United States being represented by our United States military gives a signed pledge to every single resident at Camp Ashraf that you are assured the protection of the fourth Geneva Convention, and we will provide for your safety and security. That's a pledge the United States has made. That's a pledge that I think all of us will do everything we can for as long as we can to make sure they keep it. Provide the humanitarian conditions. We're hopeful that they'll delist the MEK. So one of these days, instead of meeting in Washington, we cannot meet in Tehran. Thank you very much.